is Harold Pollack, who just has an immense presence both throughout the campus and nationally, so I'm delighted to be able to introduce him, and he's really funny. Um, Harold Pollack is the Helen Ross Professor at the School of Social Science Administration and is a professor in the Biological Sciences Collegiate Division in the Department of Public Health Sciences. Professor Pollack is the co-director of the Crime Lab and the Center for Health Administration Studies at the University of Chicago. He's published widely at the interface between poverty policy and public health. His recent research concerns HIV and hepatitis prevention efforts for injection, injection drug, users, drug users, drug abuse, and dependence amongst welfare recipients and pregnant women, infant mortality prevention, and child health. He received his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and computer science from Princeton University, holds master's and doctorate degrees in public policy from Harvard, and was a Robert Wood Johnson Scholar in Health Policy Research at Yale. Today, Professor Pollock will speak on the topic, Gender and Socioeconomic Disparities in Caregiving for Fragile X Syndrome. Welcome, Dr. Pollock. Uh, thanks so much. I wonder if there's, a, uh, if there's a, a video that I can turn to that has the answer to all the questions about the phone plans, because uh, as they were going through that, I was like, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so. Um, uh, I want to talk today about uh, some joint work that, I, that I've done with Rebecca Feinstein, who uh, was a doctoral student at SSA and is now uh, at Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem, uh, where we interviewed uh, caregivers uh, for, who are taking care of individuals uh, with Fragile X Syndrome. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a, uh, of a roadmap, I'll tell you a little bit about what it is, because some of us here are familiar with it and some not and talk about the personal challenges that the 39 people that we spoke to uh, uh, related to us and how disparities emerge in many ways, ironically, through helping systems that are nominally supposed to provide assistance to people on the basis of need and some suggestions for what we might do about that. Uh, in some ways, the challenges that, that we talk about in our work are actually ironic consequences of the success of American public policy and changes in American life over the past 40 or 50 years. Uh, talking to people, we heard a lot of sad things from caregivers. In, in a multi-generational context, this is not a sad story. Uh, it is dealing with new dilemmas that emerge from, uh, from some of the positive changes, two of which are deinstitutionalization and the increasing lifespan of individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities. Uh, the, uh, because of deinstitutionalization, which is a word that has in some ways an unfair negative connotation to it, most people with intellectual disabilities are living now uh, on a human scale in their own communities, often in their own family homes. Uh, and they're also living a lot longer. The median lifespan among people with mild or moderate intellectual disability exceeds 70, and even people with more severe disabilities are still living uh, much longer than they used to. And, um, and that means that men are gonna outlive their primary caregivers. Uh, right now, an estimated 855,000 Americans with intellectual disabilities live with a caregiver who's over the age of 60. And this is one of the major challenges that we face. Uh, and most of these caregivers don't have a plan for what's, uh, what's going to happen when their loved one uh, needs care and they themselves are no longer best equipped to provide it. Many are on waiting lists for services. Uh, 365,000 families are currently on waiting lists for Medicaid uh, home and community-based service waivers. Uh, and the average wait time is 5.3 years. And Illinois, I should say, ranks number 48 in the United States in intellectual disability services. And uh, our wait times for services are, are quite impressive. Uh, they're, um, uh, so let me say a little bit about the specifics of Fragile X Syndrome. I think one of the challenges that we have in intellectual disability is each of these conditions is quite different. And actually within each condition, there's tremendous heterogeneity. And I think Americans have very positive views in many ways of people with intellectual disabilities, but those views are often uh, based on stereotypical images, whether positive or not so positive, uh, it, coming from popular culture. You know, life goes on. Uh, a whole series of ways that we learn about people. And uh, Fragile X is a particular 
uh, condition. It's actually the most common heritable condition uh, that causes intellectual disability, uh, but it's also very rare in the lives of most people. So uh, there's an unwanted repeated sequence on the X chromosome, uh, and if you have enough of these unwanted repeats, it methylates a key, uh, a key uh, protein required for cognition. If you have more than 200 repeats, you're considered to have the full mutation. Most individuals with the full mutation uh, are significantly uh, living with disabilities. If you have between 50 and 200, you're considered to be a pre-mutation carrier. And about one in 150 women and one in uh, 468 men are identified as pre-mutation carriers who have health uh, conditions themselves and who also are, face reproductive risks. Uh, so, if you are a full mutation carrier, uh, about 1 in 3,800 men have it, most of whom, 90% of whom, have IQs below the age of about seven, above, below 70, and also some characteristic physical features and behaviors, hand flapping, palm biting, uh, shyness, and some attention and sensory issues. Uh, women also have uh, uh, fragile X syndrome, but we men are the weaker sex because women have that extra X chromosome, which uh, which often moderates the symptoms, about 25% of women uh, with full mutation uh, you know, would be identified as intellectually disabled. Quite a few people with fragile X also satisfy uh, uh, diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorders <coughs> as well. Yeah. That's the Cliff Notes version of, uh, uh, of a very complex medical condition. Uh, two things I should say about it that relate to the people that we talk to. Uh, one is that it's very easily overlooked, especially among girls. And, uh, and, and because it's a genetic condition that presents throughout the family constellation, many of the families that we talked to had multiple people in the family who were affected in various ways by Fragile X. So in this respect, it's different from, sound, from Down syndrome, for example, uh, because typically there's one individual that a family is caring for, but you don't have multiple people so often in the same family with, with such challenges. I should say it's also very common for individuals to be diagnosed because they have a younger sibling who is diagnosed. And uh, uh, so, so several of the people that we talked to had multiple children uh, with a full mutation. 25% uh, of boys and 39% of girls with a full mutation are diagnosed when a, young, when a younger uh, sibling is. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so in, in 2014 and 15, we conducted two focus groups and, and a series of open-ended interviews with people. Uh, we recruited uh, participants from our focus group at an academic medical center and a fragile X clinic, and we also recruited individuals for, for individual interviews from the clinic, but also from a parent listserv and a Facebook group. Uh, now, I should say the title of my talk referred to gender and socioeconomic disparities. It did not refer to race ethnic disparities. And when I show you who we interviewed, you'll see why. Uh, there's a remarkable skew in who joins these uh, social media groups and participates in, in surveys, at least as we uh, experienced it. So, uh, of the people that we interviewed, uh, 35 of 40 people filling out our survey were women. Mostly they were the moms of people who uh, were living with Fragile X Syndrome. 35 were Caucasian out of, out of 39 who identified ethnicity. So, uh, so one of the disappointing aspects of this particular study is we did a poor job of, of achieving a race ethnic diversity in our sample. Uh, most of the people with Fragile X Syndrome who the caregivers were, were, were caring for were young men, usually in their 20s. Uh, although some were older. Most were living at home, although some were living in group homes or other arrangements. And uh, you'll see, we, you know, of the 39 people who filled out this complete survey, you'll act, if you count up the number of individuals, you'll get, you'll get 46, uh, because some of them had multiple children uh, that they were caring for. Uh, so one of the most poignant things that we uh, learned about in this survey uh, was the prevalence of safety issues. And you know, I'm a caregiver myself, but I never had this particular issue. A third of the parents in a national survey of Fragile X Syndrome caregivers reported being injured by their sons. And most of the time, if that happened, it was a repeated experience. And many of the women that we talked to described how 
um, how much of their lives was governed around avoiding triggers among their, uh, that their child might experience that would lead their child to become aggressive. Uh, so I, I know a common conversation was I know all the things that set him off and I sort of avoid, I, I know not to touch him at breakfast and things like that. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, he's not aggressive or violent just for the sake of it. I know what triggers it. I spend the majority of my days working around knowing how to prevent something like that from happening. And you have these middle-aged women who are living with these 25-year-old men where there's a genuine safety issue that these women are facing. There was one woman who described how her son accidentally pushed her down the stairs and uh, broke her rib and punctured her lung. And she remained very wary of sending him to a residential placement. And there were a couple reasons why she was wary. Uh, one was, she said, you know, the places that I really would want to send him won't take him because of these behaviors. And the places that will take him have other young men with the same behaviors and I'm scared to send him there. Uh, you know, if, if I'm setting him off because I touch him, what's going to happen if he's with a 23-year-old man who's got his own issues? Uh, and um, it was striking how many of the women said, as long as it's directed at me, I'm basic, I can live with it. If he starts directing it at other people, he can't be in my home anymore. But as long as it's just with me, I can learn how to manage it. Uh, and that was quite striking. Uh, there, um, oh. Hmm, sorry, there. I don't know how to operate a clicker, even though I have a PhD from Harvard. There. Um, so um, uh, another thing that we found was there was a real mismatch between the life course of the caregivers and the individuals they were caring for, and the available <laughs> services. A lot of people said, you know, when my son was in school, I got an amazing amount of services. But unfortunately, a lot of these services are, are organized around this normative transition from high school out of the home, something like that. When my son was no longer of school age and he had really important life transitions, I was in this different adult system that's much more rationed. And I couldn't get the help that he needed. And I, I don't have time to talk about it today, but a lot of things that are very easily provided to a 17-year-old are very hard to get for a 26-year-old. And, uh, and also the caregivers themselves have a lot of life transitions that our helping systems are not even recognizing as important. You know, the systems are designed around the need of the individual with the diagnosis, but the need of the person taking care of that individual is not considered to be a primary mission of many of these helping systems. So you have these women who change jobs or retire or get divorced or are taking care of another family member, and they need help, and that is not recognized in the same way that the needs of the person that they're helping are recognized within administrative systems. And so that leaves these women bearing the burdens of that. Uh, another issue that comes up is, I was, th I was thinking about the pension question before. My ears per perked up, I'm very interested in, uh, in behavioral economics. Many of the, fi of the caregivers that we talk to don't have a plan for the same reasons that, that many of us are not contributing enough to our 401ks. It's like, I, I, I definitely know it's a problem. I'm gonna get around to it. But right now I'm trying to prevent my son from like hitting me at breakfast and you're like asking me why I haven't like gone and filled out a special needs trust. Like I'm gonna get to it sometime. And, uh, and sort of behavioral inertia. There were a number of people when we asked questions and they got very nervous because they said, hey, I know this is a problem and my plan is basically someday I'm gonna have a plan. And, uh, and, I, and we can all relate to that. Uh, and there was tremendous fear of what would happen. I, I thought this quote, uh, our motto is to live one day longer than our kid, just, just one more day. That's the, we heard a lot of comments of that nature. Uh, only 10 of the 39 people that we could get complete surveys for had, uh, had a full concrete plan for legal guardianship, housing, and financial planning for their child. Uh, and the choice architecture that people are confronted with makes this much harder. I don't, how many of you have seen the, Sendel Malanathan has this book, Scarcity, about how hard it is for low-income people to make financial decisions given the cognitive loads that they face navigating uh, the world every day. And so much of the, the world that caregivers live in uh, is like this, where they're in a world where they're on long waiting lists, where there's crisis-oriented resource allocation that really demotivates and de-incentivizes people to do sensible planning. So, you know, I could visit a group home for my child, but 
they're not going to have an opening in that group. I, I can't get in there right now because I, I'm, I'm like seven years in, you know, out on the waiting list. So why should I go look at a place where I can't really get access to it now? Uh, and what will actually happen is someday I'll be in a crisis and I'll have to take whatever's available in that moment. And so it's very hard to focus on making a sensible transition plan for that 63-year-old mom who's thinking about what happens. Now, ironically, a lot about the system generates disparities. So, uh, so in, I'll, I'll just say a few things about gender disparities and then get to the socioeconomic. Many of, many of the people that we talked to were moving in and out of the workforce. And what's happening over time is that these women realize that if their children are really going to get the care they need, they have to spend more and more time out of the workforce doing stuff or taking jobs that are consistent with family caregiving. And incrementally, that shapes their lives more than they might have intended when they were 30. So uh, you know, people are just realizing, if I want to have a high-functioning child, I'm, I'm, going, I'm the person who's going to have to do it. Uh, we also saw, no surprise uh, here, dramatically unequal family division of roles. Uh, so my husband sort of relinquished that responsibility to me, always citing me as the expert. And so a lot of that has fallen on me. And there's been a huge amount of resentment on my part, thinking, why am I the one doing all of this? Now, I should say many of the men are also sacrificing, but it's often uh, bringing in more money so that the family can make it work economically. And they get this very gendered division of roles. But there was tremendous, tremendous sense from women, sometimes just in a matter of fact way, sometimes in a more angry way, that, that, that they know they're the ones who are doing it. Uh, many of these women are also taking care of their parents or other relatives, sometimes other people with fragile X syndrome. Uh, so the typical quote, I'm, my mother is 80 and my dad is 81 and he's failing very fast. And the, que the awkward question comes up, what about their own children and what role are they going to play in caring for a disabled sibling? And there's a tremendous reluctance to, ex to put this burden on their children. Most of the people that we talk to don't want their non-disabled child to take their disabled child into their home, but they do want that person to play a certain role in making sure that things are done well, and it's the daughters who end up really doing that. And, uh, and, you, and they, become, uh, uh, they become groomed to take on some of the responsibilities that their mothers are doing. Uh, now let me speak to the economic disparities. We have a crisis and need-oriented service rationing system. But if you think about it, crisis and need are not self-defining. They are words that are defined, they're administrative categories that are defined within a narrative that you have to present to a bureaucracy. And it's a pretty complex bureaucracy. And bureaucratic complexity rewards people who are good at dealing with bureaucratic complexity. And who is it that has the resources and the skills and the education and the access to help to, to make those most convincing narratives? It turns out it's very often parents uh, who are more advantaged, who have access to the resources, who can hire professionals to navigate difficult systems, who can prepare persuasive paperwork and just strategically engage the bureaucracy. Uh, and many of the, we also found that what public school your child attended mattered a lot also. So a lot of the nice public schools up in the northern suburbs of Chicago have tremendous programs for individuals with intellectual disabilities and they help a lot of the parents get connected to good systems. And parents that were going to less affluent communities for their public schooling had access to much inferior services in that way. Uh, and of course also wealthier parents are less reliant on public services because they can pay for services if they have to wait for them. Uh, so one of the ironic things occurred in a focus group where our most affluent respondent, was that, is that my timing bell that went up? Two minutes? Two minutes? Okay. Our, our most affluent respondent uh, was giving advice to one of our least affluent respondents where someone called our least affluent respondent and said, are you in crisis? And the person said, no, I'm not in crisis, but you know, my 19-year-old son is in a diaper and I could use some help around my house with some stuff. And, they, and this other person said, that's the wrong answer. 
you have to say, I am in crisis. I'm, my marriage is falling apart. I'm going to take my son down to the emergency room because I can't take it anymore. That's what you have to say so that you can get services. And she said, and she said I had to learn how to be in crisis. You have to have the worst crisis day you've ever had in your own mind. Someone told me how to be in crisis, and I was in a crisis. And she, by the way, this is, she was trying to help this other person. She was saying, this is what you have to do to elicit services. But it was just so ironic that this other parent who was less advantaged took great pride in not being in crisis. I'm taking care of my son. I'm doing a good job. Uh, and if you look at some of the innovations that we put in policy to try to help parents, they are often designed for the grooves of an upper middle class life. Uh, so ABLE accounts are a way to try to help parents set aside money for their child that avoids Medicaid asset tests. And they're very much like college accounts that many of us have, a 529 account. And of course, that very sentence that I just spoke illustrates the class bias that's involved. If you are a cashier at Target, you probably don't know what a 529 account is, and you probably don't have a 401k. And if someone says you can open an ABLE account, your reaction is probably, well, WTF is that, you know? And, um, uh, and uh, now imagine that we did it differently and the government set up your own ABLE account for you and just put in a modest amount every month. Make 25 or $50. These are people for whom the state governments are spending a huge amount of money. We could actually change that so that instead of being an opt, instead of being an opt-in thing that requires you to put up some money and figure out how to engage the system that government does this for you, we'd have a lot more parents involved. And we don't think about how to reduce that disparity and, and bureaucratic complexity. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, uh, so I can say more about that if people are interested. Uh, I'll just close by saying that we've done a great job of uh, deinstitutionalizing people and removing the institutional bias in where people live who have disabilities and helping people live in their own communities. But we have not done a good job in changing the institutional mindset. And we have, and the Faustian bargain that we've struck is that we have really put on the moms mainly of many people with intellectual disabilities the burdens of making uh, a real life for people, uh, you know, work in a humane way, and it's taking a big toll on these women, and it's one, it's a very quiet burden that we often don't think about. So with that, I'll stop, and thank you very much.